Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe, subscribers new and old. My name's Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. We're going to talk about some of the earliest Art Adams comics uh, to see print, Jimmy. But first, what do you got for us? My latest comic, Octobriana 1976, is out everywhere, printed with fluorescent ink to do a blacklight effect. It's available in stores, it's available online, and it's selling well. So if you want a print edition, pick that up sooner rather than later. And there's also a 350-page process zine that I made that goes with it that's available on my website, jimrug.com. It's also available in Comixology. So wherever you buy comics, you should be able to find Octobriana 1976, at least for a little bit. Patreon.com slash Ed is where I'm serializing my current comics project, Red Room. Uh, three bucks will get you the complete archive. Issue one is up there in total now. The artwork is on that site at a high enough resolution that people have been sending me uh, their bootleg copies. Uh, send us two so Jim could get one. And uh, issue two is being serialized as we speak. Uh, every Tuesday, new pages go live, man. So three bucks will get you that archive. Check it out. But Jimmy, uh, we're back off of our horror month of comics, man. And uh, going through the the back issue bins here, I thought, why not take a look at... Uh, an Art Adams vehicle. This is a great comic to put under the under the camera. It's such an interesting, influential comic too. I feel like that whole first generation of image guys took from this. Yeah. Um, along with lots of other fans and readers, you know, I think became their the Art Adams fans from this because this was not what most Marvel comics looked like. Not at all, man. First off, uh, we got we got pen inking, which is something that you wouldn't see very much. I guess Terry Austin would probably be one of the great pen inkers and here we have uh anderson maybe brent anderson and uh wills portachio are the inkers uh, yeah one of one of the image guys who drops out was known as a penciler but started as an inker yeah space force moratory strike force strike force uh, strike force moratory when i was getting this video together and doing some research the way i was going to sell it was um that this was a vehicle created for art adams to kind of shine like i was gonna i i sort of seem to remember like you know his submissions were found in the slush pile and everybody went gaga over stuff not quite the case annie nocenti was uh a um an assistant to carl potts and wrote this story yeah there it is right there uh s tried to get every artist uh in the bullpen to draw it for her went down the list and came to uh eventually to uh art adams I love that story because it does feel like this was a star vehicle for Art Adams. And it's great that the backstory is nobody else wanted this and he took it and shined. Uh, you know, I always think that's the case. Like whatever, however the opportunity presents itself, that's all that matters is going forward. You know, sometimes people complain because they weren't the first choice or they feel slighted or whatever. Doesn't matter. All they're going to remember is the book. So, like, you take that book, even if you're a, a, a distance from the first choice, and you make it your own, and it's like, I don't remember who turned this book down. All we remember is, like, this is a legendary book because Art Adams shows up and looks completely unique and nails it. Yeah, it sort of falls victim to the flexographic printing uh, of, the, of the 80s, which a lot of his, his Marvel books I was going to say, do. nobody's a bigger victim of that than Art Adams. Yeah, and it's, it's a twofer process because the, the pen inking gets uh gets fucked up but also um the color separations now this is not bad but his later um more like the annuals like the new mutant stuff the separations like say for this caucasian flesh tone the dots are way further apart so all of his faces look like the characters have measles um this first issue you see it just like annie nocenti's new at writing comics art adams is new at drawing the stuff and he was fighting, like, after he started turning pages in, um, he started fighting for an extra page here and there. And each issue gets subsequently thicker and thicker. Eight months he had uh, to, to pencil this. Like, he, he says that, you know, he's, he's the kind of guy that uh, if you give him eight, you know, if you give him unlimited time, he will never get something done. It's all bound by the deadline. And one of those things you got to figure out early on is, like, okay, if... if you have a, a year budgeted for this, uh, that can go by pretty quick. And he worked on this for eight months. Yeah, that that's uh, in some ways it's an artist artist. You know, I think the bud the deadlines are our friends, right. even if we think we hate them. Uh, but you know, if you have a year to work on it, like 
you need to break that down into chunks that make sense too. Like, what do you do in a week? What do you do in a day? Yeah. And and then just you got to stick to it. But spectacular drawings, and it does look like uh, early work in that every inch is filled up. Yeah. Um, panels are dense. You know, being an early writer's and artist's work, that's what you see. It's almost an inefficiency or an insecurity of like, I got to show it all, and. It makes for an interesting comic. You it know, it's, it's something that falls away as you become more confident and, and understand the mechanics a little better. But pretty fun for uh, for the reader to just, see this kind of explosion. Just to give some idea about, like, the time he had uh, available to draw the thing, he said there was no, no deadline on this. And eventually he started to figure out that, like, if this book don't get drawn, like, it will just never come out. So he made it work. But this is September 85. And I was taking a look at some... Uh, I really like this comic book artist magazine. It has some some very thorough interviews, and at a time when you know Comics Journal was was fallen by the wayside, wasn't doing what we loved it to do, and probably was never focusing on Art Adams. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> so this is like sort of the long shot period period of uh, the interview, and when Art Adams would go to uh, comic conventions when he was just like a kid, you know, like a, like a random like those guys that you see at the cons who don't have any real published work uh july 1983 and this is spiral you know this is a character that shows up in two or three issues after two or three issues of long shot so i love this character design too i feel like it influences characters like foreplay and forearm and and any characters that have the multiple limbs very cool looking this is a cool thing too man it's uh the character design uh for long shot you know i'm not quite sure what he's telling us about the spine i guess it's um more uh you could see it easier than the, the regular person but nailed that 80s hair man really nice reproduction too the comparison between like the printed comic book pages and the reproductions in comic book artists it's great line art reproduction he he uh you know this is no no surprise but he t- said that you when he saw michael golden stuff like that was a wrap you know, when he saw those Micronauts issues, he was he was ready to move forward. And he he comes into comics at a weird period. Like he's kind of peerless in in many ways. Or I guess you could say that he's like the first generation of like that image generation, uh, you know, with McFarlane and those guys. Because this is he's coming from an era of people who would have been fans of like the uh, Barry Windsor Smith Conan and Walt Simonson's work. I see like George Perez in that face, I think. Yeah. And certainly the detail, right? Like right. Perez is very, very detail oriented in, in this way. Whenever you see stuff like this in an Art Adams comic, he's definitely, he's probably putting some people in there that, uh, you know, there are some inside jokes. Like I see Gumby. Right. Already. And that's like the bad Gumby. Like one of those <laughs> blockhead gimmicks. Yeah, I kind of miss the days of uh, stuffing the crowd scenes with, with Easter eggs. <laughs> and when you see a face like that, it makes you think that like that's probably based off of somebody. Maybe. Almost looks like Michael Jackson. <laughs> that's who I thought of, yeah. I don't think Michael Jackson looked like that at the time, though. This would be a great artist edition. I think so, too. Like any of the uh, art atoms from, from this period. Did they make a Micronauts artist edition? I think I think that I sounds that. right. Yeah. Which is incredible, you know, that they were able to corral all uh, 12 issues of that or, or whatever they got together. Look at this stuff, though, man. That's that's pretty accomplished for a kid just out of the gate. Yeah, I mean, that's Castle Grayskull, right? <laughs> yeah. Really benefiting from having sort of uh, way more time than your monthly cartoonist. And and I, I don't think that that's ever changed for him in his career. Like, like, he's never done a monthly book. It would be impossible. And it's always been special stuff. But they always recognize him as a special talent and create those vehicles for him. Yeah, highlights, of course, being several of the mutant annuals over the years. Something to seek out, you know, if you want more of this, if you're watching this and want more of it. New Mutants and X-Men annuals. I think he's got three of them that that he did. Yeah, a couple X-Men annuals and then the New Mutants uh, summer special. The inking is starting to lighten up here. Yeah, I am... It it is interesting to think about like this guy doing submissions in a time whenever it's definitely not the house style, right? And the various reactions editors would have had to that. You know, a lot of people probably overlooked this guy. If if this was a, a distant choice, 
um, you know, because nobody else was doing it, you have to imagine other people saw his work and, and were like, eh, this is weird. Right. But very quickly, his star rises, and, you know, he's drawing those those uh, apple seed covers for, you know, the Eclipse uh, version of the comic. This this is some wild shit right here that you just would not see in a comic. It's, it's like suicide humor. <laughs> it feels like as soon as this is published, he becomes a fan favorite. Yeah. You know, like the fans have no problem latching on and, and, and digging the stuff. I think it was just editors that must have looked at it and said, I don't know, this is different than what everything else looks like. Yeah, very rigid in, I mean, in that thought process. <laughs> that is, this is why you go do apple seed covers. Yeah. This is your submission if you want to draw apple seed covers. <laughs> I mean, right? Like, that's such a uh, cyberpunk shorthand kind of thing. Absolutely. And he's just, like, just maniacal line, man. This is cool, man. Like, every issue you see this character, he starts to morph and change and get bigger and more gnarly uh, because he's kind of, like, growing into his final form. And he starts off as, like, a playful R2-D2 and then becomes, like, the villain of the uh, comic. Yeah, if you notice at home on these covers, that character morphs in the little corner boxes. Right. You know, as he's, as he's growing along. How lucky is everybody involved in this project that they got the right anchors? Right. Because if you put Al Milgram on this, if you put... You know, even Dan Green, who I like a lot most of the time, it would be a totally different look. It would. And I think the look, you know, I, I, I don't know that it would be as successful. You know, it feels like this is the way, when I think of Art Adams, this is Art Adams. Like, this is a guy that shows up, this showcases him as he is. It's not like this is rough in the beginning and he turns into Art Adams. This is Art Adams. Right. And they got it right with the inker is a big reason that it's Art Adams. I guess Annie Nocenti created those little characters that would have been in the JRJR Daredevils, like the, all these little dudes. And I wonder if this is their first appearance or, you know, if this is like her earliest comics and she brings them into that or how, however that works. But I like those little characters, man. They're like, you know, her version of the Yancey Street Gang. Right. These Got pages it. are so dense. They are. They are. And, and like Mojo, like the Mojo design is like a design that you want to curse because it's like you have to draw every wire in the head. Like you, nobody wants to be the one who drew the, the weakest mojo. And freaking Art Adams starts it off at a very, very high level. Yeah, there are several of those characters that have that type of quality. Longshot's that way. When I was drawing Longshot in fucking uh, X-Men Grand Design, I was cursing this little bandolier of those little blades. <laughs> and also, like, the leather texture. It takes me a long time to ink that. And I was kind of cursing uh, Art Adams the entire time. Also, there's a marauder. Like, if you remember the marauders, like, there's a marauder who has, like, a metal suit that's just, like, all sorts of, like, little nuts and bolts. I think JRJR created that guy, and I was cursing him when I had to draw that guy. That's so funny. I often say, like, whenever you're doing a dense page or whatever, it's, like, number of characters that appear on the page more so than your number of panels. Right. And some of these pages have so many characters. They do. He's... He's definitely, because the lines are so tight, uh, he's definitely using like one of those like 0.5 millimeter mechanical pencils when he's turning it into the inker. Your DeLuca effect with all the in-betweens. Yeah. He draws a good Spider-Man in here. There's there's like one, like like this is incredible. Yeah. Pretty strong. I love I love when there's lighting on Spider-Man's costume and, and uh, he really pulls it off well there. Yeah, those white eyes pop. But, you know, stuff like this. That is a lot of figures it is. for a page. Yeah. Really good at backgrounds. Mm -hmm. You know, he's that's that's the one thing that the image guys did not pick up from uh, from Art Adams. And look at this. Like, just draw every little dazzler uh, star that the anchor... Like, dude, so you're, a pe you're an anchor, and you're in the game, and you get, you know, whatever you get, and then this page of pencils comes your way? Yeah, no, no fun at all. Ditto for the colorist. Or the separator, I should say. Yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't be too much fun, like, cutting out all those different shapes. <laughs> it's a lot of work. It's it's really cool. It's like, okay, this panel is, like, the greens that we have available, the purples, the blues, the hot colors. There are Charlton comics where they would color, like, full figures like this. You know, just one color, skin, clothes, everything. And it, it looks cool, but it's it's such a weird thing. It's, it's weird to see it in a Marvel comic. <laughs> 
<laughs> Let's just skip real quick to uh, to the final issue, man. Uh, awesome cover. Just show that off a, a little bit before we, we get the heck out of here, man. But I, I don't know, Jimmy. I've been very inspired lately looking at the early works of the uh, creators that, uh, you know, I grew to dig a whole lot more. And I think, you know, for as formed as this is, there is still a rawness to it compared to what Art Adams grows into being. I like these to look through this stuff as a reminder to just uh, just keep working, man. The rawness appeals to me a lot. Yeah. And I don't know how you keep hold of that. I, right. Because it's that you become more educated. Right. Like The rawness is almost things that are drawn wrong, mm -hmm. choices that you wouldn't make if you had to do it over again. <laughs> you know, right. you learn through experience and then you fix that part. But there is some quality about it. It, it's there's a liveliness to it there's like an imperfect world there's a real warmth to that i don't know how you keep that part yeah and there are the guys that, like you know that's what's great about like you know gary gary panther is able to tap into that because even this feels in some ways tighter you yeah know, like, like he's gotten the experience of 150 pages now under his belt and it's just more short you know you see these pages are slightly less we're not seeing full figures every other panel. Right. You know, you get an establishing shot maybe and then and then you're off off and running in a close up and mid range. And then this is this is what happens in every Art Adams comic for about <laughs> twelve years is when we get to the end, start getting a little less backgrounds. Definitely like like that. Like Art Adams when he's when he's firing hot when he's starting a new project, you will not get this panel. Uh, in the <laughs> it's first, never a page one through eight. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and you know what? I bet you he learned some things because this is tight again. I bet you he would like draw a couple pages up front, draw a couple pages in the back. That's and, a good move. And then, uh, yeah, end strong. Look at that magenta, man! It's making the pupils of my eyes kind of pinhole. Such a hot color. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's... Very it's, 80s. It's pretty cool to see his art with that blown out magenta background. Agreed. Agreed. And, you know, uh, Golden, they were selling the idea of that, like the Golden uh, Doctor Strange, man. So it's almost like Art Adams is filling that role. And there it is, man. That's a nice, strong finish. That's a hell of a wrap page. It is. Once again, man, these comics were like prohibitively expensive when you know they were at the height of popularity certainly when i was a kid i think i first read the thing when i was like at, at art school but uh got these babies dime a piece wow yeah it is funny how that stuff cycles up and down but this was a pretty legendary th this came out before i really started reading comics and it was like one of those legendary books was expensive you know at the time it's probably still there at ides right now man, <laughs> with the same price tag that it had in 1992 when i first went there ah uh, could be could be i always pay, pay homage to it whenever i go visit the shop man once again man very inspiring taking a look at the early raw efforts of uh you know cartoonists that i dig man so it's time to get back to drawing our comics jimmy uh, K favors like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when the next vids are available. Octobrian is in stores now, and it's also available on Comixology. Uh, Patreon.com slash Ed is where I'm serializing my current uh, Red Room comic. The first issue is up there right now, and three bucks will get you that archive. You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video to keep up with everything that we have going on. You can find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. Give them those Martian orders, Jimmy. Read more comics.